in my mind, there isn't anything that's unachievable. The question is, what is a path to get there? Do we have to take over the Senate to, uh, to be able to pass Medicare for All? Yes. yes, we do. Do we have to take over the White House to pass Medicare for All? Yes, yes, we do. We do. Um, and yes, we can. But let's not be short-sighted and allow what we know to be right and our vision for justice to be clouded by sticking our finger up in the air and seeing which way the wind blows. I'm here right now with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who is also the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And we're here at the Congressional Progressive Caucus's summit. Um, this has been an incredible couple of days, beginning with the, um, the panel discussion at the end of She the People. Right. And Every time you open your mouth, Congresswoman, I am inspired because you are both so powerful, you, you wield the truth, um, and you're speaking, I think, to what most Americans want, access to health care um, being sort of the foremost. Um, can you talk about this moment in American politics? Um, and even globally, we see there's pro-democracy movements and expressions of, of anger about the inequality of our economies. Can you talk about right now and what this moment requires of us? Is this a business as usual moment? No, no, so far from that. I mean, this is, I think, one of the most important moments in our history. And um, when you think about all of the things that are happening, we are in the midst of a constitutional crisis, mm -hmm. first of all, with a president who is abusing the power of the Oval Office, that is asking foreign allies to interfere in our elections, that is completely disregarding Congress and the at least co-equal nature of our branches of government. Um, so there is that whole piece that is happening. But when you think about where that comes from, um, I like to say that Trumpism didn't start and won't end with Trump. Right. Um, and it gets to what you're talking about. We live in a country today that is supposedly the richest country in the world or one of the richest countries in the world. And yet we have three people, two of whom live in my state, who have the same combined wealth as the bottom uh, 160 million Americans in this country. And that is completely unacceptable, but it is also the place where the divisions that corporations who have so much power, that white supremacists who are trying to push their agenda, racists, xenophobes, all of those people can tap into this sense that people don't have opportunity. They don't, they don't have a government that's listening to them. That nobody's really taking care of them. And so we have to address these big structural problems and that is never going to be possible unless we get the participation of people. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of at the same time that that really difficult stuff is all happening, we have the most progressive, the most diverse House of Representatives in the history of Congress. Mm -hmm. And that is making a difference because when we elect people, you know, now we have the first two Native American women, the first two Muslim American women. I'm proud to be the first South Asian American woman, the youngest woman, um, so many more Latinx people. Um, when you have that kind of diversity, what you start to see is people responding to government in a very different way and also a boldness of proposals, structural reforms, right. because so many of these diverse members of Congress come from really seeing the trauma on the ground of all of the working people, white, black, and brown, who are suffering. So it's a moment, uh, you know, as an organizer for 20 years before coming to Congress, right. I like to say that strength emerges in times of crisis. And um, that is, I think, what you see, a movement that is unifying, a movement that is um, pushing for bold change that will mm -hmm. actually reform some of these deeply embedded problems that we have, institutionalized racism, sexism, classism, and I think pushing for something very different. If we don't protect our democracy here and show that democracy can really work, then we can forget about trying to stop the demagogues and the dictators around the world right. that are already trying to tear down um, democratic institutions and, and ideals. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about addressing the structural problems that Trumpism is really just the head on the monster of, yeah. how do we do that? Is impeachment the answer? Is it enough? How do we bring our movements into the, 
the Democratic Party or into government in general? Well, I mean, we're here, you know, and, and the Progressive Caucus is a perfect example of this. We have a hundred, uh, it's either a hundred or a hundred and one members um, in the House that are part of the Progressive Caucus. That's 40% of the entire Democratic Caucus. But more than that, there are the movements that support this work. And um, no, impeachment is not the answer to how we fix uh, the country. Trump, um, whether it is through impeachment or whether it's through a 2020 election, we do need to get rid of Trump. And I think we have a case for impeachment of high crimes and misdemeanors. But even if it were to go to the election, it's important to get Trump out. However, that doesn't fix the problem. So structural reforms that we need, we need to take on white supremacy, we need to take on corporate supremacy, and we need to take on individual supremacy. Mm -hmm. And those sort of three supremacies are at the heart of the kinds of reforms we need. Big tax and financial structures reform, voting rights reform, immigration reform, um, healthcare reform. We need to take the profit out of some of these critical pieces that are necessary for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to return power back to the people. Labor reform so that we once yes. again strengthen collective bargaining and the right for workplace democracy. Mm -hmm. These are all part, and, and then of course, climate. I mean, we, you were mentioning Jane Fonda, mm -hmm. um, a dear friend of mine, and you know, we need to make sure that we are addressing the urgent crisis of climate, which by the way, has all three of those supremacies yes. that I mentioned tied right into why we are not making progress on, on climate. I wanna go down and talk about everything you just mentioned. The first thing that's coming to mind is about workplace democracy, yeah. because it's so exciting to hear Ilhan Omar yesterday mentioning that you know, the, the government needs to support a reformation of the way we do business in the country so that workers are more likely to be owners of the businesses where they work or that we can have worker elected boards. Right. Um, how do we make that happen? How, how well, there's some really great stuff happening. Um, the, I worked with the Domestic Workers Alliance mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of groups to put forward a National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which is an interesting, um, it's, it's not quite sectoral bargaining, mm -hmm. but it's in that direction. It uses the concept of a wage board to set the standards for domestic workers across the country. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to that, it corrects the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which actually left out protections for domestic workers because they're in individual households and those weren't covered. So it really combines a number of different things. We have the PRO Act, which um, we have passed through committee, Education and Labor Committee that both Ilhan and I sit on. And the PRO Act would really strengthen collective bargaining and the ability of workers to form unions. Um, and then you see some really interesting alliances that are forming to, and honestly, the Teamsters sort of came about this way, like the organizing of truck drivers. These are, were individual owners and um, workers that worked for those truck drivers, but that sector was organized. So the concept of sectoral bargaining um, and how we even organize gig workers. You know, we in Seattle, I mean, it's been challenged, but we put forward uh, legislation that passed the city council um, to organize Lyft and Uber drivers. So we need new models of organizing, but we also need to strengthen the tools that um, have frankly been eroded through the NLRA and the NLRB, and we need to restore the ability for workers to strike. We need to um, increase the penalties for workers who try to oppose unions mm -hmm. um, and delay the, the contract negotiations. So there's a lot of pieces to that, but it's pretty exciting some of the things that are happening and some of the ways in which we're pushing. And if you look at the fast food workers, another perfect example of how the Fight for 15 got started mm -hmm. and what that kind of organizing can do. Um, in terms of kind of moving to Medicare for all, what is the status right now? Um, how close are we to being able to make that happen? And how do organizers, how do we sort of push towards making that possible next year going into an election? Well, um, this is a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare is a huge crisis for Americans across the country. We have people who are dying. Mm -hmm. We have people who are going bankrupt. Half a million Americans every year file bankruptcy because due to medical costs. 
Um, we have people who can't afford insulin treatments, cancer treatments. Um, we have people who are trying to decide between paying the mortgage and um, paying for their, their tr whatever health care needs they have. We have people splitting drugs at their kitchen table because they can't afford the whole prescription. Um, so it's a crisis. GoFundMe is like people's main insurance program, and that is absolutely outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. So 70 million people who are either uninsured or underinsured, tens of millions more who cannot afford their health care, even if they have coverage. Medicare for All says everybody is in and nobody is out. A guaranteed, single guaranteed um, insurance plan provided by the government mm -hmm. that cuts the profits out of our uh, current for-profit system that's controlled yeah. by the insurance companies, yes. private for-profit insurance companies, whose CEOs make $50 million, $82 million in salary every year while people are dying. And remember that the government uh, programs have about 2 to 6% of administrative costs. Guess how much the private insurance companies charge for administrative costs? 25 to 30% of taxpayer dollars for all healthcare expenditures in this country go to administrative waste. High CEO salaries, 50 million to 85 million dollars for a CEO salary when people can't get insulin, when people can't get cancer treatments. And so the way we've structured Medicare for All, um, and I wanna specifically talk about folks with disabilities because this is actually a big thing that we put into my bill in the House, and I want to thank my sisters on stage because everybody is on the Medicare for All bill. Um, we added a component that actually is not in the Senate, uh, Senate version, but it is specifically around long-term care because we think that folks with disabilities and our seniors deserve to have the kind of care that is not provided today. So in our bill, we provide those long-term services, but long-term care services, but we also say that the default for those services is community-based care, not institutionalized care. And, um, and so that is a huge part of this bill. And we have moved mountains with what we've been able to do this year, thanks to the movement, many of you in the room. Um, we have, for the first time, been able to get three, not one, not two, but three hearings in the House of Representatives on Medicare for All, first time in history. Um, 250 economists have written a letter um, endorsing the, the bill. Um, and to the racial justice component, we brought in for the first time a giant racial justice uh, coalition, and we had a wonderful um, press call and conference about the specific pieces of racial justice that, that are in the bill, but also the ways in which we need to transform the system. We also need to make sure that we are getting diversity into our doctors, our, our nurses, all of our healthcare professionals. We need to make sure we're paying people well. Not all of that is in Medicare for All, but there are other pieces that we are also moving. So for example, the HEAL Act that Representative Holland and I have put forward also goes pretty deep into how we make sure that immigrants as a whole are provided comprehensive care, that we take away the five-year bar for, for health care. Um, <laughs> but Medicare for All is a fundamental change in mindset. It says that we want you to go see a doctor. We want you to have comprehensive care. We want you to have reproductive care. We get rid of, we repeal the Hyde Amendment because every yes. woman deserves to have reproductive care. Where are we now? Mm -hmm. We have more than half of the Democratic caucus has signed on to the bill, so 119 Democrats. Um, we have had not one, not two, but three hearings on Medicare for All in the House. That's never happened before. Um, we have the largest coalition of labor unions on board because labor has figured out that even when they've negotiated their contracts with healthcare for their employees, they've given up wages. So wages are directly related, stagnating wages, to rising healthcare costs. And so SEIU, NEA, AFT, UAW, the machinists, they're all on board for Medicare for All. We have a great racial justice coalition that has really uh, come out for Medicare for All. And then we have over 250 economists who have said, this is what makes sense um, the right way. I was just in, a, in a, one of the sessions where this um, two business owners from Vermont 
we're talking, um, and this woman has 48 employees. Um, she has been providing health care for her employees because she wants people to be healthy and taken right. care of. She told me that it is now costing her half a million dollars to provide health care, $500,000 on her balance sheet to provide health care for her employees. But here's the real tragedy. She said it still doesn't cover their their insurance costs. So they're contributing personally to GoFundMe campaigns for their employees who either don't seek the care they need or they just can't afford it and it's an emergency and then they still have to try and raise money. And she said, I'm just all in for Medicare for All. What can I do? Tell me how I can help. We want to help get more businesses because this is hurting all of us economically, competitively, and in our hearts and our values. I mean, and largely the argument against Medicare for All is simply that it's going to raise taxes, but I think what people don't realize is that the costs for hospitals end up coming down to taxpayers anyway, you know, when you have to when you have to see uninsured people constantly because their only form of health care is the emergency room. Right. Um, how do you communicate that to to the voters, right? Because yeah. so many people turn off their ears the moment they hear taxes could go up. Well, you know, what's interesting is that this seems to be this issue around how you pay for it and the cost yeah. and taxes. It seems to be an issue of the pundits on television mm -hmm. um, and the presidential candidates are, that are getting harangued about it uh, or haranguing others about right. it. But it actually is not a big um, issue, according to the polling, with okay. the voters. Okay. And the reason it's not is because they are thinking about the cost that they're paying. So they're thinking, wait a second, I'm paying $10,000, $20,000, I just got a surprise bill for $30,000. You know, the things that people are going through every day, right. um, they realize that they are paying so much in out-of-pocket costs, co-pays, private insurance premiums, and they're still not getting the health care they need. So um, it isn't really an issue for the voters. but. It is absolutely 100% true that if we had a Medicare for all system, when we have a Medicare for all system, we will bring down the costs that Americans are paying and we will give them comprehensive coverage. Why? Because our current system, and this is what nobody wants to talk about when they talk about costs, the current system costs us 3.2, excuse me, $3.9 trillion a year. $3.9 trillion a year in healthcare expenditures. Mm -hmm. That is going up to $6 trillion in the next 10 years. Medicare for All, even by the conservative Koch brothers' um, uh, estimate, would cost $3.2 trillion a year, $32 trillion over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's just accept that estimate. Hmm, by my calculation, 3.2 is a lot less than 3.9 and certainly a lot less than $6 trillion. So the federal government is already paying two-thirds of the cost of these expenditures. Really, all we need to do is come up with that last third, which is about a trillion dollars. And businesses right now and consumers are paying that much right now. And mm -hmm. that is only set to go up substantially. So even if you took a portion of that, you could cover the costs of Medicare for All. They could pay less. You could raise the taxes on the wealthiest if you wanted to give business owners a break and let them pay a little bit less. Um, you could raise the taxes on the very wealthiest or make corporations for pay their fair share. There's a lot of ways to come up with that last little bit if you don't want to just have business owners put everything that they have, uh, that they're currently paying into the system. So lots of ways to deal with it. That's not the real issue. The real issue is that pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to convince the American people that this is somehow going to hurt them. And guess what? The American people still aren't buying, which tells me that this is a powerful idea with a powerful movement behind it. Mm. Your, your leadership is, is helping to transform the culture of the Democratic Party. And um, yesterday, you talked about how what it means to be progressive is to come at the best ideas for justice first. Yeah. And how women of color in this country are so often the ones, although unsung, right? So often the ones who come to that place. And now that we have more women of color in the Democratic Party, in government, we're seeing hopefully this culture change, moving towards more progressive policy, more progressive ideas, more progressive representation of, 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 what, of what needs to be talked about. Um, can you just 
talk a little bit about what it has been like since 2016 to be in this, this extended moment of crisis in our country, yeah. but also to be part of this cultural shift towards making the Democratic Party more progressive. Yeah, well, I never wanted to be in office. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was an activist on the outside and I was pretty skeptical of elected officials. Um, because I didn't see many of them. There were few heroes, sheroes, you know, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Lee. I mean, I had a few. But, um, but I had this, I suddenly realized that we are seeding, giving up this important space for organizing. And um, when I was arrested right here in, in DC, leading a, a, um, a huge uh, civil disobedience protest with 100 women, and 27 of them were undocumented women who had so much to lose. It was the first time that such a large number of undocumented women had ever gotten arrested and we were protesting for comprehensive, humane immigration reform. I realized that we have been pushing and pushing and pushing from the outside, but why aren't we on the inside? Why do we have to push so hard to get our ideas taken seriously. And maybe what we needed to do was come on the inside and change the whole way that we think about organizing so that there isn't even an inside or outside, but that we have organizers populating all the most powerful platforms that we need to push for our progressive policies. Yes. I would say Laura is doing that with journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are others as well. Uh, Amy Goodman, obviously. Right. I mean, people who have been doing that with journalism um, we have had incredible movement organizers, you know, do wonderful things, but we need more inside office. And so I've tried to bring those principles to the work I do, how I craft a bill. Um, we bring our movement partners into the room to craft the bill. Mm. Um, how we organize protests or what happens when there's a horrible thing, like when I heard about the family separations and I was the first member of Congress to go into a federal prison and I heard 227 women and men, mothers and fathers, telling me that they didn't even know where their children were for three weeks, four weeks. They could hear their kids crying. They were ripped from, their, their children were ripped from their mothers and fathers. And working with movement allies within three weeks, we turned out half a million people into the streets. This is what we have to do. We have to bring street heat on the inside we have to do it on the outside, and we have to be willing to stand up for the things that we know are necessary, and not just, not just go along with the things that seem possible right now. Our job always as activists and organizers is to push the boundaries of what's seen as possible, mm -hmm. and now we get to do it from the inside as well. So it's been amazing to see that with the newest class of women, you know, awesome women of color, um, Ilhan and Alexandria and Ayana and uh, Rashida and but also more than that you know there are other women Katie Porter um, people who are really bringing some important voices to the table guys like Mike Levin Josh Harder they're they're in swing districts but they ran on Medicare for all because they knew it was the right thing to do Johanna Hayes first African-American elected in Connecticut and with all those insurance companies in Connecticut when I asked her to get on Medicare for all she said, I know my insurance companies and the D-Trip and everybody else is telling me don't do this, but I ran to do the things that matter for my constituents and I'm going to get on Medicare for All. That's a beautiful thing. Yes.